Thank you, Pastor Chris, and good morning, everyone. How's the 11 a.m. service doing? Very good. A little more lively. We're, we're, uh, we're starting something new today, and what an amazing opportunity, and I thank Pastor Chris for the, uh, for the joy of starting this, this new series, we're going to call it. I believe we've got the little thing there, Summer in the Psalms. I, I love it when the, uh, the S's roll off the tongue, even though it's a, the PF, but, but it's a P, S. We're blessed to live in a nation where we can gather like this. Amen? Um, we are free to be able to express our convictions and live out our beliefs in this great nation. Um, however, Scripture is actually very, very clear to us. And if you got the, the Daily Bible app and it gave you the verse, you were, you were very quickly convicted this morning as it says, only we, may we not, or, oh, sorry, tongue-tied, right off the bat, forgive me, only may we be careful to not use our freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but instead, in love, serve one another for God's glory. So, along with every new series, what comes with it? A new memory, memory verse. That's right, very good. And so, uh, Chris said, would you go over it? And I said, I would love to. So, our memory verse for this month uh, is in Ephesians. So, we're going to put it up here. It's Ephesians 5, 19 20. And so we're going to say it together. It says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that, that verse alone has a sermon in it, okay? But as we're looking to memorize this, I, I noticed three key words, and I want, you, I want you to focus on this because whenever I'm memorizing scripture, I have to go this one thing where I have to say this one, and then when I get to that comma, okay, what's the next word that I have to start with? And then at the end of that comma, what's the next word? And we all know Paul and his run-on sentences. So we're supposed to address one another. That's the first thing. Then we're supposed to sing and make melody. And then we're to give thanks. So address one another, sing and make melody, and give thanks always. And I think as you guys maybe use those three key words, uh, I don't think we're going to need the, I don't think we need the words up on the screen next week. Do, do y'all think? No? Okay. <laughs> Memorizing scripture is hard. I'll be honest. Um, I, I was recently challenged to memorize a significant chunk of scripture. And I had never done that before um, to an extent. You know, you, you memorize Psalm 23, you memorize the Lord's Prayer or um, and one time I had, I had a friend memorize the entire Sermon on the Mount, and I was like, whoa, that's, that's amazing. But don't underestimate the power of, of abiding in God's word. Don't underestimate the joy that you can get and have day to day by taking, you know, starting at the beginning of a chapter and taking two verses. All right, I'm going to read those two verses ten times. All right, the next day, the next two verses, read those verses ten times. Review the ones you did before. Keep going. And before you know it, you'll have memorized not just verses, but you'll have memorized chapters of Scripture. And the crazy thing about it is when you meditate on those verses, then as you face stuff throughout the week, and you're going to see, we're going to face stuff throughout the week, those things pop into your mind. And then you can either speak truth in love or you can speak truth to yourself. So I would encourage you as you look that these memory verses are not just cliche. They're not just giving lip service to God memorizing the word of God. What does it say? I have hidden my wor thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The whole purpose of scripture is to make us more like Christ. So that being said, I would like to start today's sermon with a little bit of a game of um, finish that phrase. We'll see how you guys do. Actually, I realized that maybe, maybe the phrase that I knew of one of these was not exactly the phrase that everyone else knew earlier. So it's kind of funny so let's see how you do. I'm going to start it. You finish it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, there's a little caveat there. There is no good people. We're going to learn that a little bit later today. Um, let's see about this one. God helps those who help themselves. Yes. And another one. It will either make you bitter or it will make you... Ah, there it is. Because I reversed the other two and, and they... They, they, then they said, someone said stronger, and I'm like, okay, so I have to reverse it. So it's bitter first, or it'll make you better. I had to modify this one to be kosher for church. Life is hard, and then you, yeah, <laughs> okay? I, got, I, I, I still remember that in high school. Someone was like, that's, that was their philosophy. 
Life is, they, they said a different word than that. Life is hard and then you die. And I'm like, what a horrible, morose and morbid view on outlook on life. But it brings to bear humanity's face with this difficult question. Why do people suffer? Why is life hard? Why is there evil? What is evil? Why is there pain? And why do people die? Now, as a father of three, my wife and I, we're faced all day long. Bumps, bruises, falls, cries, anguish when losing the game. The pain in my own heart, watching my child have anguish, losing the game. And then there's the whole backseat trouble, right? He hit me, he's touching me, he's poking me, he's looking at me, and I'm thinking, I will turn this car around. Okay. But if we actually take a step back from that level of suffering, pain, and anguish, what about famine? What about genocide? What about every single family that is missing a loved one from the collapse of the building in Florida? Death. From un, of untold millions through the wars of history. Poverty and suffering everywhere. Millions killed by abortion, murder, divorce is rampant. Untold medical complications from cancer to mental disease. And so, what does man do in the face of all of this, right? We try to fix it. And I could say political slogans on either side that's supposed to make us have hope or supposed to rebuild or we're supposed to do this, that, and the other. We're supposed to make something great. We set up programs to try to alleviate the suffering or create a sense of well-being. There's philanthropy. There's feed the world. There's give money here. There's serve here. There's save the planet so we all don't die a horrible heat death because there's too much carbon dioxide and methane. It's exhausting. It's expensive. And none of it seems to be making any headway. Why? And if you believe the Bible's true, all of those programs are actually doomed to failure anyway. The environmentalists really don't like that. Why is there this overwhelming longing that how the world is, is not how the world was meant to be? You feel that longing? It's this groaning in our heart. Are you ready for some good news? After all of that, I'm sure you're ready for some good news. God knows it. God knows all of this. God made us after all. And so we need to start by allowing God to shine hope in our lives. And we're going to do that today starting with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. This is another one good, good to memorize. So if you get into this whole memorization thing, this one would be a good place to start as well. Let's read it together. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. Okay, so let's go through that piece by piece just so we make sure we don't miss anything. The Father's divine power, the power of God, has granted to us all, not some, not maybe, he's granted to us all things that pertain to life, not death godliness not evil through the knowledge of him found in god's word praise the lord for the bible who calls us to christ's the his in that verse is christ's own glory and excellence god is promising us to make the believer more like christ throughout their lives even in our trials and our failures and our sufferings and certainly in the bible the whole, the whole book is the, the whole collection is a treatise on suffering from the creation being cursed from Adam and Eve to Job to Joseph to the nation of Israel and Egypt to the prophets, the apostles, and the ultimate example of Christ. In each of these stories, Romans 8, 28, God is working out all things for the good of those who love him. So as we said earlier, this month we'll be focusing on the book of Psalms. It's a 150-chapter book roughly found in the middle, so kind of take the Bible and go right in the middle. You'll find it. It's composed of poetry and lyrics that are meant to be sung as songs of remembrance with God and to God for our encouragement. It's basically God's hymn and prayer book. And I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to heaven because then I get to find out what a shimineth is. And all these other little things that says, according to this, 
or I'll find out who the sons of Korah are, or I'll find out what the melody is that was really sung to Psalm 23 or Psalm 150. I'm a music nerd. Forgive me about that. But I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I'm looking forward to hearing that. And so each week, we're going to be talking about one particular type of psalm. Uh, The four we'll be covering this month are the psalms of lament, the psalms of praise and worship, the psalms of wisdom, and the psalms of royalty. And with all the doom and gloom that I just like dumped on the room to start, I'm pretty sure you guys know which one we're going over today, right? Lament. We're going over the psalms of lament. But that's not a word that we use very often in our culture today, is it? I don't usually say like, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to lament. So what does that mean? Us understanding the meaning of that is a key to becoming close in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Lament, it's expressing deep sorrow, grief, or regret. And it doesn't take us long to make a list of all of our griefs, sorrows, and regrets. I could fill a couple pages. But I'm so grateful as we walk through these two specific psalms today that we will see this beautiful thread of hope that God continues to weave into our stories in the midst of the suffering we find in this life. Amen? Psalms of lament follow a general pattern. And you're gonna, I'm, I challenge you. I want you to write these down. I want you to be looking for these as we read because we're going to read most of every verse in, 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 the, in each of these psalms. And you've got to give a hand to the people in the back. They, they, were, they were copy and pasting a whole lot from my notes to put all these scriptures in. So thank the Lord for them. But we need to learn these four steps of lament. You ready? We're going to put them up on the screen. So write the first one down. It says, first, turn to God. Turn to God. And that means we can't be looking at ourself. The second is complain or present our problems. Okay? Complain or present our problems. The third thing is once we've turned to God and we've complained, we get to ask for help. And God is ready. He's ready right there waiting for us to ask. He wants us to ask. And the last part is to trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. But there's a subtle danger that we find. Anytime we make a list, oh, this is how this works, or this is how that works, or this, if we make it a how-to manual, we must be careful to not turn what we learn into rules to follow. Because that's not how God works. The nation of Israel got caught up in that. The Jews in Jesus' day got caught up in that. Look where it got them. It got them into legalism, self-righteousness, and pride. And I've been reading a bit of Oswald Chambers this, this, uh, this year. And out of the blue, I mean, he'll just, he'll just lay one on you. And this is, this is one of his quotes. He says, men pour themselves into creeds, statements of belief, something that they feel they can stand on. And God has to blast them out of their prejudices before they can become devoted to Jesus Christ. May we all have that level of conviction. And granted, organizing the information from God's word into a three-point sermon or a two-point sermon or 12 steps to this or, heaven forbid, trying to apply it to something like living your best life now, you know, those, those can be helpful, but, they, but it's dangerous because God's after our heart. He's not making rule followers. He wants a relationship. He wants us to experience life and all of its ups and downs with God. And he promises to be our guide and our rock to stand on when we're shaking. And just like relationships, that can get messy. It's okay. Relationships are supposed to be messy. Now, honestly, in in due diligence, I do actually have two points that we'll be doing today for this sermon. So I'm sort of following my own rules, but not really following my own rules. Because remember, it's not about doing. It's about a relationship. Let's actually pray as we dive in. Father in heaven, we're grateful. We're grateful that you've made a way. We're grateful that we understand the perspective of a Christian has hope in the face of suffering. And as we look to learn how to lament this morning, how to bring our griefs and our sorrows and our pain to you, I pray, Lord, you will draw us in. Draw us into that closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, question number one. Question number one. How do we lament our own sin before God? How do we lament our own sin before God? Join me in turning or navigating your app to Psalm 51, where we're going to learn how proper lament before God 
can do something amazing. It can restore fellowship with God after it's been broken by sin. While you're getting there, here's the context. This is important. King David, all right, a man after God's own heart. He made a choice. He chose to be where he was not supposed to be. He should have been away at war with the army, and he stayed home in leisure. He saw something then he wasn't supposed to see, which was a beautiful woman taking a bath on her rooftop. And then he did something he was not supposed to do. He got her pregnant, and he had her husband murdered. Now, you can go read about this in 2 Samuel 12. Uh, and again, just like most scripture, there's a whole sermon in there. But this is the summer in the Psalms, not the summer in the Samuels. So I'll let you guys go enjoy that, okay? But it begs the question, how is David able to be known as a man after God's own heart when he does all stuff like that? Murder? Adultery? There's a three-step thing about why David is still be able, to know, be able to be known as a man after God's own heart. The first is because when he's confronted, and you'll see in this psalm, it's how he responds to the Lord. How he responds to the Lord when he's confronted with his sin. His acceptance of the Lord's judgment as just and right. And the most important part, this is the proof. It's the change in his attitude and actions as a result of the conviction. Imagine then, as David, being so convicted in his own heart that he's then willing to write a song about his screw-up and then tell everyone, here, I want you all to learn this song. I've written a song about my screw-up. Talk about transparency in a politician. I don't, think, I don't think any politician today would ever do something like that. And it gives a huge national implication for at least the nation of Israel of the phrase, confess your sins one unto another that you may be healed. At the end of this, there was not one person in Israel that probably had not heard of what King David had done. But they knew King David's heart. And they knew that God had restored him. And that meant they could also know that restoration for them Restoration for each person who heard that song is available. So let's check your notes. What was the first step in lamenting? Turn to God. I love audience participation. You just took two minutes off the sermon. Congratulations. All right. Verse 1. Let's dive in. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. So we have to start out by defining mercy. What is mercy? We surely don't see a lot of that in today's culture. Mercy is undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. David is proclaiming right off the bat. He says, I have no merit or standing before God right now. I am guilty. And the next phrase he uses is, according to your steadfast love. Why is that important? Up until now, King David has the whole history of the nation of Israel and the oral history of the world before the nation of Israel in Egypt to know that God has been famous for his steadfast love and the fact that he comes and he delivers, especially in the judges, the time of the judges, when the people's hearts turn back to God, God will deliver them. His steadfast love is famous. Turning to God means also agreeing that your actions are sin, which is the next step of presenting or complaining your problems to God? So we find in verse 3, David has already moved from turning to God to complaining. He says in verse 3, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. When we say, think, or do Things that God calls sin, it's very important to know that although others may be affected by it, ultimately we're only responsible to God and God alone for our problems and our sin. Matthew 10 28 says very clearly, don't fear the judgment of man. All they can do is destroy the body. You need to fear God because he can destroy the, both the body and the soul in hell for eternity. 
verse 5. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David already knew the inclinations of the human heart. The history of Adam and Eve, original sin, and how that affects everyone, because all came from Adam. We sin, let me, you might want to write this one down. We sin because we're sinners. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. And the beautiful part about this is David is owning his sin, which means he's then prepared to seek restoration and renewal. The first part in actually being able to receive the gospel is understanding how evil you are and that there's no hope for you apart from Christ. So this is where David begins the process of then asking. He says, behold, verse 6, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. The first point from this verse, it's impossible to hide from God. We think, we think God doesn't see. He sees. The fool says in his heart there is no God. David says in other Psalms, he says, if I flee from you, hither and yon, east, west, up, down, left, right, be a select start, you, you, you're there. You see me and you know me. Therefore, he demands that we be transparent, repentant, and submissive when he calls us out. The second, and this is, this is the cool part, this is where God wants to speak truth and wisdom into our lives. He says, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. What's that? That's that inner place where we get to go to meet with God. And God wants to speak to us moment by moment as a close companion so that whatever we face during the week, God's right there. And we know there's no amount of rule following that can prepare us sometimes for what comes in the week, right? God wants to be right there with us going, this is the next right thing, do that. In verse 7, he says, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, he's mentioning ceremonial things. But what happens when I say the word purge? There's, there's a lot of things and some very negative connotations that, that come out of that. But the basic definition is it's forceful removal. To purge is to forcefully remove something. God wants to perform surgery on our hearts. He's the only one who can do it. He wants to remove all of our evil desires and our evil heart, and he wants to grant us a new heart. He wants to give us a heart transplant, but guess what? He's not going to force us on the operating table. No, God is a gentleman. And part of how we respond is that we see how good God is, we see our depravity, and we get on that table and say, God, I'm, I'm yours. What's that song that says, I'm available? We're supposed to be available for God. That breaks the strongholds in our lives. In fact, that's the only thing that breaks the strongholds in our lives. Verse 8, he says, let me hear joy and gladness. I know there's no other way I can experience that except on the other side of God doing the heart transplant. He says, let the bones you have broken rejoice. Now, I can tell you the only bone I've ever broken in my body was this finger right here. And it was not very pleasant, mind you, okay? And I didn't really feel like rejoicing. When you look at your hand and this is bent this way and back that way, and you're going, that is not supposed to look that way, okay? I didn't feel like rejoicing at that moment. In fact, I was actually kind of scared. But for all of you who've probably broken a whole lot more bones than me and seen a lot more drama, you probably didn't feel like rejoicing in that moment, did you? So what does David mean when he says, let the bones you, wait a minute, he's talking to God. He's saying God broke our bones and then we're supposed to rejoice about it? The thing is, God can use anything in this world to bring us to the point of brokenness so that we can realize how good he is and rejoice in it. Does that make God unjust to use things like that? No, it doesn't make him unjust. In fact, that's, that's an accusation that many want to say. God allowed this to happen. And that's why I don't believe in him. And I'm like, well, then who's to blame? Pardon me. That's, that's my own little moment. But at, at the same time, 
when God uses those things, it makes him loving. Because how else would we know how, how bad we are and how good God is? Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, he says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father and the son whom he delights. So think of the parent-child relationship. A parent who loves their child disciplines their child when they do wrong so that they can learn to do right. Without discipline, a child descends into willful, selfish narcissism that will plague them for the rest of their life. Is that loving? So understanding of the lament of our own sin actually brings us to the point of our standing that our suffering can actually bring us closer to God. And I think God loves those aha moments. I certainly love those aha moments with my three boys. If I'm training them to do something that's not usually pleasant in the learning, and all of a sudden they get it, they go, oh, wait, I finally understand that if I do this, and I learn willful disobedience, and I do these things, and I don't learn to keep my tongue when I want to say something bad, that's going to get me fired from a job as an adult. Or I'm going to have horrible consequences down the road. I love it when I discipline them and they understand. And I see that in their head. Or if I'm training them to do something new and it's a struggle and all of a sudden they realize they get it. I think God looks at us when we go to him with our problems and our struggles and he loves it. He loves it when we get that aha moment of, oh God, this stinks You've got my back. You're teaching me how to be more like you. You're teaching me how then to be more like Christ and to live a life fulfilled the way God intended it. In verse 9, he says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. God can hide his face from sin. Now, this is in the Old Testament. How is that possible? Let me share something amazing with you. God's outside of time. And when Jesus died on the cross, the most amazing thing happened. The sins of all those who were called before the foundation of the world to be saved and to believe in Jesus, they were forgiven. Boom. Past sins, present sins, future sins. My sin was on the cross with Christ when he died. And it was paid for. And as a result... The sword of God's wrath that was hanging over me, waiting to destroy me and send me into hell for all eternity where I would be exposed by to nothing but God's wrath has then been melted into a shield. A shield of Christ's righteousness that I have the privilege to hold by God's mercy and grace. John Piper calls it the asbestos suit of God's righteousness that gets to be applied to us. And that means we're free to enter into God's presence when we die. Amen. Now that David has turned to God, he's presented his problems. Now he's ready to ask God for help. And this is the next step, right? It's turn, complain, and ask. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. When David says, create in me a clean heart, he understands something very, very important. Just like we said, God's the one who has to do the surgery. There is no level of rehabilitation that can be done to us to make us worthy of the Lord. It just can't be done. It has to be replaced. The old flesh, the old self, they'll tell you otherwise. They'll tell you that satisfaction can actually be found in the world. And you'll chase it. But at the end of it all, there is no greater point of grief which can lead us to godly lamenting when we experience what the world has told us will give us ultimate satisfaction. And when it's over, what are we left with? Emptiness. No satisfaction. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. We have no other hope for life fulfilled and satisfied than through Christ. 
And here's a little bit of a landmine. What does David mean when he says, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me? Some people have interpreted this, that, that they feel like you can actually lose the Holy Spirit. And granted, in the Old Testament, David saw the Spirit of the Lord actually removed from his predecessor, King Saul. Does that mean Saul lost his salvation? We don't know. That's between Saul and God at Judgment Day. But as a believer on this side of the cross, let me tell you something. When you accepted Christ and you, you let him do that heart surgery and he gave you a new heart, at the same time, he gave you the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now living in you. Okay? You can grieve and you can quench and you can offend that Holy Spirit. But if you're truly his, you can't lose it. You can't. And you might feel that people you love that say they've accepted Christ and they're wandering away and they're doing stuff they know they're not supposed to do and you're tempted to give up on them, heaven forbid. It is never our place to say that a person is too far gone. That's God's job. You keep praying for that person. And if they're truly his, God in his mercy and in his timing, he's going to draw them back around in circumstances until they come back. In this context, however, for this passage, it's best to understand that David was talking about the fellowship with God. And just like we talked about for the Christian, confessing, repenting, and turning from sin is the key to then having the restored joy of salvation. And that's what upholds our faith and our spirit in times of trial, suffering, and persecution. David wraps up this first psalm we're going through today by then trusting in the Lord, the last step. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Let me explain something. It's another song of worship. Let's see if you can complete it. This is my testimony from death to life, because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify for Jesus Christ the righteous. Through Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. When God has done something amazing in your life, there should be a fire burning there. There should be this awe and reverence that says, man, I got to go tell somebody what Jesus has done for me. You walk up to people and that's what you need to say. You need to say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. He's changed my life. Not, have you heard about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Which way do you think is going to actually prick the hearts of the unbeliever to begin to consider their evil ways? This is my testimony. Death to life. Jesus in my place. That's the gospel in four words. He calls on the Lord in verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. David closes us by a powerful reminder that it's not about doing or following rules to get favor with God. If a person says, me and the man upstairs have understanding, they're lost as a ball in high weeds. <laughs> Jesus even quotes Hosea saying, the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. Paul says that our self-righteousness is like filthy rags to the Lord. And the only way you can be is you can be in a relationship. And I was convicted this past year. I knew a lot about Jesus. But just because you can know somebody or know about somebody doesn't mean you actually know him. I said, Lord, this year, please, please take me to where I can know you. And when you pray that prayer, guess what God will do? He'll do it. He'll do it in ways you ain't going to like because God's in the business of giving you what you need, not what you want. So as we seek that intimate relationship with Christ, I pray God will show us the sins in our lives that need to be removed. Our constant prayer should be, God, okay, God, what's next? Refine me. I want myself to be consumed. That's a really hard song to sing. I want to be trialed by fire, purified, 
God, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing. Man, that scares the living daylights out of me. Does it scare you? But in the middle of that fear, God is saying, this is the best thing for you. I pray that maybe using this pattern of working through lament, not as a rule, because it's going to be different for each of us, remember, we turn to God, we present our complaints, we ask God to change us, and then we trust and stand on his word. That leads us to question number two, and this one gets much, much deeper and much, much more painful. How do we lament the sins around us to God? How do we lament the sins around us to God? Turn with me to Psalm 55, where we're going to see that same pattern apply. Turn, complain, ask, and trust. Turn, complain, ask, and trust. And this this psalm is going to help us face two problems. So let's shift gears. Stick with me. This is good. The first problem that God is going to teach us is how to process evil or sin committed directly against us by others. And before you tell me, you don't know what it's like to be me, Christ does. He knows what it's like to be abandoned by his disciples. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by Peter. He knows what it's like to have his fellowship with the Father directly affected on the cross as he took upon himself the sins of the entire world. So even if I don't know what it's like to be you and your suffering, or you don't know what they did to me, God does. Christ does. The second thing this psalm will teach us is how to process evil that we see in the world. How many news junkies do I have in here? Everybody everybody in the first service was like, I'm afraid to raise my hand, right? As Christians, let me be clear, we are not called to live under a rock and plug our ears and go la la la, because how else would we know if we don't keep up with what's going on in the world, where we can go to minister to those who are hurting and in need. Because we're supposed to loving and leading people to life in Jesus together. But, without the direct help of God and a pattern that we must be diligent to follow in seeking after God's heart, if you look at any news article, doesn't matter which side it is, which website it is, it says, you should be offended. This person did this, or this person said that, and you should be angry about it, and you should tell as many people about it, and you should share it as on as many things and platforms as whatever is possible to make sure that everyone else feels exactly the way that I feel because I wrote it, and I think you should feel the same. May I tell you, that's poison. That is dead-level poison, and if you let it, it will consume you. It's not even an election year, and it feels like that. Praise the Lord that God is giving us his peace in the midst of whatever is going on in the world. Praise the Lord we're given the tools that we need in this life through the word of God to face the things of life and yet keep the faith and stand firm. Let's dive in first. First verse. Give ear to my God. Give ear to my prayer, O God. And hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Give ear to to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Have you ever felt like your pleas are just bouncing off the ceiling? I think we can all identify. It feels like we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and it feels like God is silent. And that's a terrifyingly lonely place to be. And those times can create one of the worst dangers a Christian can face. Are you ready? Doubt. Anyone in here have doubts? Anyone here have faced doubt? I have. And as a Christian with a testimony of many, many, many times of God coming through in the 11th hour, when I doubted and he always provided, that's my testimony. And you know what you need to do? Doubt your doubts. Doubt your doubts. Because how we feel doesn't change fact that God is for us and he is there and he is listening and he is in control 
How we feel does not change the fact that God is in control. If your feelings are, are leading the train, you're going backwards. The feelings are supposed to be the caboose. David continues, he says, attend to me and answer me. I'm restless in my complaint and I moan. God uses restlessness. St. Augustine is famous for this quote. He says, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. The struggle here is that some complaints and questions we have, they're not going to be answered, or they're not answered right away, or they're not answered at all. They might not be answered this side of eternity. Part of having faith and believing in God is understanding that we don't know everything. We weren't meant to know everything. If we were, we'd be God. Or if we did know everything, we'd be God. And that's not our place. But you know what the most amazing thing is? We're supposed to rejoice in the knowledge that we have been given. And even more so, remember, we're after a relationship. God wants us to ask. He delights in us asking. He wants us to struggle with these harder questions of life. If only to find that 2 Corinthians 12, 19 is true when he says, when the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. So then Paul responds, he says, So I will boast of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If God is leaving you in that place of restlessness right now and you feel like you're not, pray- you're not having your prayers answered, there's a reason. He's asking you to trust him and he's telling you to endure. Because at the end of perseverance is hope. But why is David complaining and moaning? So now we find him doing the presentation of his problems and complaining. He says, verse 3, because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. Noise, oppression, trouble, anger, grudges. Do you know these things are promised to us as believers? Christ actually promises these things. He says in John 15, 18, and 19, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. And therefore the world hates you. Praise the Lord, we're not left hopeless. And God is not offended when we complain to him about the evils we see in the world. Honestly, I was thinking about this just this morning, and I, the level of communication, it's like, and, and I've not experienced this yet, but I've, I've been able to give this as a gift. It's like when I call my dad out of the blue just because I want to talk to him. And I've, I've moved out of the house 20 years now. I think my father's tickled when he hears from me. I think he's just grateful that I've called. I think he longs for that communication with me as his son. And and what sweet fellowship we can have with that. God's, God wants us to talk to him. Even if it's in the midst of complaining. He wants to talk us through our pain. He wants to talk us through our hurt. So in the face of all this wrong that David is seeing, he understands that that communication with God is key. David says, my heart is in anguish within me. It is impossible to remain unaffected by the pain and suffering in the world. It's, it's going to get you. You can think, oh, no, I'm fine. No, it's coming. Let me tell you, it's coming. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me, and I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away, and I would lodge in the wilderness, Selah. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. It's okay to tell God about our fears. In fact, it's the only way we can actually work through them. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. The horrors of the world do create a strong desire for deliverance. So it's okay to ask God for relief. Just like David says, oh, that I had wings like a dove. Let me get out of here. But just like as a parent who has to deal with their child getting up in the middle of the night, scared, scared of Lord knows what, scared of stuff that isn't even real, 
scared of stuff that's not logical, scared of stuff that's completely unreasonable, scared of stuff that's completely imaginary. God wants to talk us through that fear. Maybe not necessarily deliver us from it. May we be able to then pray those amazing promises found in Psalm 56, 11 and Psalm chapter 4, verse 8. It says, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And the other is, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? In verse 9, David takes it from personal anguish to, being, to calling on God to avenge. And this offers a difficult question as well. He says in verse 9, Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. Is it vindictive for us to pray for the destruction of the wicked? As believers, is it vindictive? Actually, no. Because when we pray for the destruction of evil, we're actually asking Jesus to come back. We're praying for God's perfect justice. We're crying out that the world is not the way that it's meant to be. God, please come and make it right. In fact, that's the only hope we ever have of justice. We hear people talk about justice of all these different types these days. They define justice to make it whatever they want. Let me tell you, there's only one real type of justice, and we're not going to see it this side of eternity. But when it comes, oh, how sweet it's going to be. Because then there'll be no more pain and no more tears and no more sorrow. Should we be also praying for the repentance of the wicked? Yes. Ezekiel 33, 11 is very clear. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord... I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? As I mentioned earlier, on this side of the cross, sometimes praying for someone's ruin or destruction is actually the only way they'll ever come to salvation. So don't be, don't be afraid to pray for God to get a hold of somebody. Maybe that'll bring them to that point to believe and accept the gift of salvation. Because then, then it gets personal. In verse 12, he says, For it is not an enemy who taunts me, because then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. I'll just write you out of my life. No, but it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house as we walked in the throng, I was close to you. David does not remain focused on the person, though. Right after that, in verse 15, he says, Let death steal over them. Let them, let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. God goes straight, David goes straight to God with his request rather than attempting to do something. What's the temptation for us as humans? I'm going to get you back. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Do you know it's not our job to enact revenge in any circumstances? In any circumstances. As a Christian, we don't even have the right to be offended. I mean it. If you actually think about it. Romans 12, 19 says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And Exodus 14, 14 also says, The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. I find that when evil happens and my temptation is to do it, I have to say in my mind, The Lord rebuke you, not me. And the temptation is not only to try to get revenge, but to also go to tell others. Somebody wrongs you, I'm going to go tell about 10 people what you did to me. I want them to be offended too. I think I'm gaining allies. But you know what you're doing? You're destroying the chance for restoration. You're destroying the chance for fellowship. You're destroying people. If 
we let the sun go down on our anger, it turns to bitterness, which leads to hate, which leads to violence. David is again praying for God's justice, but the next verses show how the correct response should be to what could be eventually, if let run its course, a, a horribly debilitating emotional sickness of isolation and just that downward spiral where the focus is all of a sudden on me, woe is me, why me, victim me, victim, victim, victim. And all that is is a false sense of self-righteousness. Verse 16, but I, I call to God, and the Lord will save me. I can't save myself. Evening and morning and at noon, I will utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage. For many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from old. Selah. Because they do not change and they do not fear God. We have to move from focusing on our problems to focusing on God. And it's only in his plan that there can be restoration and redemption. What's more, we must remember that pain we experience on this earth... It's not final. And, it's God, and if God's promise of salvation is eternal life with him, then we must be okay that in this life and on this earth, our deliverance, it might not be physical. We might die. In fact, we will die of something unless Jesus comes back. And then our deliverance is no longer physical. It's spiritual. It's the eternal security of our soul being taken to be with God forever in perfect satisfaction. And therefore, placing our hope in the Lord means removing our hope from anything that's in this world. We all should be examining ourselves. What have I placed my hope in that's not God? And I got a kick out of this part because just like that one time, you know, we get done saying our piece and we start to walk away and we go, and one more thing. David does this again here in verse 20. He says, my companion stretched out his hand against his friends and he violated his covenant. Verse 21, his speech was as smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil and yet they were drawn swords. I've heard it said that you can offend anyone, but you can really only grieve family. Why is it that the worst wounds always come from those that are closest to us? So praise the Lord for this next verse. This is the whole key. This is the kingpin that holds it together. Verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Have we reduced this to just another platitude? We sing about it. Cast my cares, I will. We say it. But do we mean it? How do we mean it? We can saddle up to that person who's suffering. We can just put our arm around them. And in that bless your heart voice, we can say, cast your cares on the Lord, for he cares for you. Does that do them right? Does that do that struggling believer or person that needs encouragement right? I would say no. It's speaking the truth of the word of the Lord. But how are we applying it? I mean, I could make a list of all the burdens in my life. And it'd be long. I'm sure all of y'all's would be a lot longer than mine. And I'm, I'm grateful that God is willing to meet us in our burdens. We can say a prayer that we can cast our burden on the Lord, but are we just doing lip service? We can say we forgive somebody, but how do we know we've actually done it? Here's the deeper truth. We can't do it. We can't. My mind can't. My will can't. My emotions certainly can't. Our flesh can't do it. Only the Holy Spirit inside of us with a close, intimate relationship can take all that horrible, balled up anxiety and tension and anger. Have you ever gotten into that attitude where you're just mad? And sometimes you don't even have a reason for it. Only God is the one that we can go to him there and he's able to lift that away from us. That allows us to apply 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. It's died. The self has been put to death, crucified with Christ on the cross, along with our sins. And behold, the new has come. So here's the thing. If Christ has won the victory 
over sin. And he has now ascended into heaven, has sat down at the right hand of the Father in victory until God has placed all of his enemies under his feet. And other scripture says that we are seated with him in the heavenlies. That means the victory of Christ is available for us right now. So only in Christ are we able to forgive. And that newness of person, it's applied in Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we are able to identify with Christ in his crucifixion that killed the power of sin over us, we are also able to identify with his resurrection in deliverance from sin's bondage. And when I hear this, and this was something that my mentor and I had to go over this year, it just came to this whole burden and I said, tell me how. How? I want this. How? The problem is there is no how-to manual. Remember? It's not rules to follow. It's a relationship. This call is going to be different for all of us. God, in his infinite mercy and grace, is going to come to each one of us at our point in time and our circumstances, and he is going to wrap all of these things into a path that leads us to seek him out, to grow, to be more like Christ. And it's only through that entering into the secret place in our hearts, entering into that conversation of prayer, where in submission we give him the key to those things that are killing us from the inside out, and then he removes our pain and he replaces it with his peace. John 14, 7, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. Let me sum up this concept with something very easy to remember. Do not confuse your condition with your position. Let me say that again. As a believer, do not confuse your condition with your position. If your condition right now is struggling or suffering with sin, do not forget and stand on the truth in the midst of the pain that your position is seated in victory with Christ. And you've been set free from the power of the bondage of sin and death. And we, as Christians, can claim that. And I'm not saying name it, claim it theology. No, no. I'm saying this is God's will that we would live in the victory of Christ. As the band comes up, I pray that you have heard, listened, and internalized that number one, there is a God. There's a God who desires a relationship with his creation for his glory. A relationship that was broken by our choice to reject God as king over us, which brought the curse of suffering and death into the world. But God loved us too much to leave us there. God responded with his plan to restore our relationship through the payment of our sins by Christ's death on the cross, because John 1.12 lays out this promise. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. As the thunderstorms rolled in on Thursday night, we were at the ballpark, and there was this magnificent display of lightning in the distance. And all the kids were ooing and aahing over. It's like, oh, that's a storm. And I you know, check the radar, and they're still like, you know, 50 miles that way. Oh, there's nothing on the radar. It's heat lightning, right? But just as we were about to leave, my phone buzzed with that little warning that says, there is a severe thunderstorm warning in your area. And I casually mentioned it. And my four-year-old, bless his heart, it was after 10 p.m. at this point. And all, and all y'all know what it's like when a four-year-old's after 10 p.m. and his bedtime was 8.30. He is deliriously tired. And he lost his mind. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a storm coming. 
Never you mind the fact that this was the last ball game for the whole week, so we wanted to get a, a family photo, of course, you know, with everybody in their uniforms and, and Heather and I in our, in our T-shirts. And, and it was all I could do at that moment because, uh, number one, I'm thinking about the photo, but then, I'm, number two, I'm thinking about my son's unbridled, totally paralyzing fear. And I picked him up. And as he's screaming this way, because I'm holding his head facing that way, because it's like, I can't do this. I leaned into him, and I didn't yell in his ear, but I said it loud enough to try to get his attention. I said, son, you are safe. Daddy's got you. Those storms are not going to get you. Bless him. He actually stopped crying and started listening. And I said, son, I need you to say this. Say it. Say it with me. Say, I am safe. And he's trying to dry up his stuffing. (laughs) He says, I am safe. And in that moment, God showed me something. He showed me how hard it is for us of someone who is desperately and incapacitated by their fear. How hard it is for them to hear that voice that God is saying, I've got you. You're safe. I'm going to deliver you. And bless his heart, you know, we wipe his tears and we're able to get that family photo, although you can tell he's got all this red eyes and the dough and he's just like, you know, But God was very quick to apply that to me. He says, how many times are you afraid? And you don't trust me. And in your fear, how difficult it is. Neelan made that decision to act. He decided to act on what I whispered into his ear. God is asking you to decide to act. Get on the operating table. Let God take the evil heart out and replace it with one that is in fellowship with him. Everyone close your eyes. Let's enter into that time of of reflection. If you are a believer this morning who is facing suffering, I want you to hear this truth that God is with you in the suffering and is ultimately is holding you safe. And the only thing that matters is the eternal security of your soul. The world may weep, but only a Christian can truly lament with the hope of glory that God is offering us. If you are an unbeliever, let me assure you there is a severe storm warning. That lightning's flashing across the sky in the distance. And it is the coming of God's judgment and wrath on the evil of this world. You may face it at your death or you may face it when Jesus comes back, but it will happen, make no mistake. God is reaching out a hand to you right now saying, I made a way for you to have eternal life abundantly, to be able to live as the way things were meant to be in perfect relationship with God. If that sounds better to you than anything the world has to offer, that means God's tugging on your heart right now. The requirement to becoming a believer is twofold. First, must we must confess, and second, we must repent and believe. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Not you might be saved. Not you won't be saved. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Confessing is just simply agreeing with God the truth that sin is sin and is deserving of death and that that problem applies to you right now. Believing in the heart then is the decision to trust and not only just trust, It's like Neelan, when he finally had to get it, he says, I am safe. He decided to act on that, and he calmed down. 
It's by casting yourself on the mercy of God. That famous mercy that when the heart turns to God, he will deliver through Christ who paid for your sins on the cross. The promised result of these two things is that God gifts you a new heart with new desires that turn away from the evil desires of the world to instead do what God calls good. And that this offer is free. He is a God of miracles. The altar is open for those whom God is calling to be saved. Our deacons will be glad to meet you here. Come and weep over your sins. And there you will find salvation. For those of us who are believers who feel the call of God to restore their fellowship with him, come, bring your lament to God, and cast your cares upon.